Good morning and welcome to Stonehouse Baptist Church Online this morning, Sunday, June the 14th. It is fantastic to be gathered again together and it is my great pleasure to welcome you here. We're celebrating this morning the fact that there is no force on earth, nothing which can stop God's people from joining together in worship and praise of our wonderful and mighty Lord. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Simon and I am the minister here. It's my great privilege to serve the wonderful community of God that exists in this place. And I want to welcome you all. Whether you are just round the corner from us, whether you are watching from further afield, whether you call this church your home or you are visiting us this morning, whether you are young, whether you are young at heart or whether like me you felt the creaks as you got out of bed today, whether you come full of confidence in Jesus as your Lord and Saviour or whether you're here wanting to know more. Whoever you are, wherever you are, however you have found your way to us today, you are very, very welcome. You are an honoured guest in the presence of the spirit of the living God who cannot be contained within a building, who doesn't reside in certain places, but who is in and around everything across creation. So let's just take a moment to still ourselves, to quiet our hearts and come before God as we prepare ourselves for worship this morning. Lord, we thank you for bringing us here together again today. We thank you that you have called to us, wherever we are, whoever we are, however we find ourselves today, that you have called to us by name, that you have made yourself known to us through Jesus Christ and through your Holy Spirit, and that you have drawn us together as your community, for this time, in this way. And we come to worship you. We come to praise and adore you. We come to bring ourselves before you in fullness of knowing who we are, that we are your beloved children. Lord, we thank you for your mercies which are new upon us every day. We thank you for your goodness in creation that you have sustained and nourished and provided for us. And as we take these moments, we pause. We lay down the things that obscure you from our view. We set aside the things that distract us and lead us away from you as we come to bow before your throne. We are amazed. We are awed. We are humbled that you would welcome us. That you would invite us. That you would bid us to come into your presence. And so we come as your beloved children, your faithful servants, to worship and praise your name today in thanksgiving for all you have done for us through your son Jesus and all you continue to do in us by your Holy Spirit. And we ask, Lord, that our hearts and minds would be open again to you, that we may hear your voice as we hear you speaking to us once again. And we pray all of this in the beautiful name of your only Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So welcome. Welcome in the name of Christ. May you find great joy and peace here this morning. May you find comfort and spiritual nourishment as we gather in his name to worship and bring our praise to God, our everlasting, all-loving, wonderful Creator Father, the Most High.
How wide, how high is the Father's love for his children? And so let's turn to him now in a time of prayer as we come before our wonderful Father, Creator, the Almighty God, and bring ourselves to him. So let us bring our prayers of praise. Let us bring our prayers of thanksgiving to God for all that he has done in our lives this week. And I invite you now just to take a few moments to lift those prayers to the Lord. In your own homes, in your own spaces, whether you choose to speak them aloud or whether you choose to uh, voice them in the quiet of your hearts and minds, let's give thanksgiving to God for all he has done. Lord, we thank you for your mercy and kindness to us, as we have seen and felt it in our lives this week. We thank you for your grace, for your love as it has poured out over and into us. And Lord, we thank you for those times where we may have missed your hand at work. For we know that you do work for the good of all who love you and who confess you as Lord. Amen. And so we come to a time of confession. Loving Father, we confess there have been times this week where we have not lived as you would have us live. We admit that we have striven but fallen short of the great call you place upon our lives. And in these moments we bring our confession to you. Holy and righteous God, we have dared your justice. We have mocked your mercy. We have jeered your patience. We have slighted your power. And we have shown contempt for your love. Lord, we have said sorry insincerely and made our confession flippantly. In these moments, we plead your help to own up carefully to how we have acted without love and faithfulness. To admit honestly where we have caused hurt and harm and to ask for your mercy and kindness to be upon us as we come before you. Here is the good news. <clears throat> All who are in Christ Jesus are forgiven by the Lord. Your sins are removed from you as far as the east is from the west. By the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, the blood spilled, the body given, you are restored and remade, granted mercy and compassion, and washed clean by the sacrifice made for you. And so as we accept God's forgiveness in our lives, Let's share these words together. God, we receive your forgiveness, the restoration of our tired souls, the renewal of our fickle hearts, the washing of our dirty hands, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. And having confessed and recognised the grace of God's forgiveness for us, we pray now. Lord, though we have travelled through many waters to reach this place, we share one baptism. Though we arrive from many different backgrounds and traditions, we share one faith. We are each of us unique and precious to you, Lord. 
and members of one body. We may have different dreams, different doubts, but our hearts beat with one hope. And as we are graced with different gifts, may we offer them in service to you, our one Lord, God and Father over all. God in community, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, in one, equip us for the work of ministry as we pray together now with one voice the prayer that Jesus has taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Strangers lost and helpless, God restored us through His Son. Breaking down the walls between us, He has made us one. Yes, He has made us one. One body, one Lord, one Father over all, one Spirit. might be. Now, some of them are quite obvious. Some people are very good at talking about God. Some people are very good at working with children. Monkeys. And some gifts might have us needing to work quite a lot. So some people are very good music. Hopefully a bit better music than that. And some gifts 
might be things like art or writing, that sort of gift. You might have to work at it, but it's still a gift from God. And some gifts might be a little bit harder to work out. Now, these gifts might be easy to see, but gifts like this, these are vitamins. Maybe you are the sort of person who makes other people feel better about themselves. Maybe you're the type of person who makes people laugh. That's a really good gift. Because when people are feeling down, it's good to make them laugh. And some gifts, maybe you're the type of person who is really good at just helping. And that's a fantastic gift. Because some people are good at talking about God, but it's really nice to have someone who can set up first, who can um, carry the Bible for you, or any tiny little thing. And those things are big things when you get them from God. Some people are also, I have lots of friends who are just really good at letting people into their homes, into their lives. And what they do is called hospitality, which is a really big word for just being welcoming to people. That's a gift from God as well. It can sometimes be really hard to work out the gift that God has given you, but actually you'll find that if you are the sort of person who makes people feel good about themselves, you do that wherever you go. Grown-ups think that the gifts are just for church, don't tell them, but they are actually for everywhere. So if you're like me and you're quite good at working with children, then what happens is you end up having conversations about shiny shoes and um, playing games in supermarkets or on trains. If you're the kind of person who is good at talking about God, you don't just do that in church, you do it everywhere. You might work on a building site and in three days the whole building site is talking about God. If you are the sort of person who makes people laugh, you do that everywhere. Your gift is not just for in church, although that tends to be where you use it the most mm. but you'll find that you use that gift wherever you go and it's that thing inside of you that bubbles out like Carleen's music it just bubbles out she sings in the car she can't help herself but worship in church or Rachel <laughs> Rachel Evans White that's somebody's mum she can't help but paint it just bubbles out of her and if you're a helper or if you're an encourager, someone who makes people feel good about themselves, then you're going to do that wherever you go. And it doesn't feel like work. It just comes out of you. So maybe this week, you can have a think with God, say some prayers, but have a think about what your gift might be. Thank you, Becky, for a wonderful introduction to uh, our th thought for today which is about the gifts that God gives us. Now Stonehouse Baptist Church I happen to know has a very talented group of young people within the church and I'm really pleased to say that some of those young people have very kindly recorded videos of themselves showing some of their talents so we've got all sorts of things um, that we're about to see from our young people and they range from uh, making Lego to reading to doing magic to acting to drawing to maths to all sorts of things I think I've got everybody there oh some singing as well we've got sorry I forgot we had some beautiful singing going on there as well so for the next few moments let's just take some time and celebrate the gifts of the wonderful young people of Stonehouse Baptist Church I'm Jonathan and one of my skills is reading and I'm going to read you a couple of jokes. What nails do carpenters hate to hit? Fingernails. What month do soldiers hate the most? March. This is a card trick you may have seen before. I don't know because I haven't been spying on you when you've seen magic. <laughs> I don't know where most of you live. Um, so... I am going to take, take the top card, that is your card, I can't see it, mm -hmm. could be like a two of diamonds. It's not. 
Okay, um, <laughs> I'm going to take your card and insert it randomly. You're going to say stop wherever you want. Stop. So, that goes over there. That goes there. Is this your card? It was. Amazing. Well done. Twinkle, twinkle, traffic lights round the corner, shining bright. Red means stop, green means go, and mum means go very slow. Twinkle, twinkle, traffic lights round the corner, shining bright. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Up above with stars so high, like a diamond in the, with a diamond in the sky. Oopsie, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. So that's the pose that you are doing. That's your neck. <laughs> Holding your phone. Got it! Yay! Are you taking pictures? That does not look like you. It doesn't look like you. Very good. That looks like someone. <laughs> looks like a weird boy. Just doing stuff. Can you hold it up and show it to me? when I was in them, but anyway. Hello, I am the newsman, and I have news. So, anyway, it seems that a pandemic is not enough. Instead, now we need a giant banana who is going around and barging into people's houses, a little bit like this. Oh, you do! I don't like your wing! And then stealing people's cheese right from the fridge and eating it whole in his mouth a bit like this mm, cheesy that is how it works with the cheese eating bananas it would appear that there has been a psychic watering can picking itself up and flying across the world a little bit like this oh yo i'm a watering can and then it finds a random things 
So she has a green bin and it tips water on them for no reason whatsoever. It's very weird. But yeah. Goodbye now. We're going to see how many maths questions we can get right in one minute. Results are coming in. 55 correct in one minute, an average of 1.09 seconds per question. Well done. Amazing. What a talented group of young people. And that's just some of them. That's just some of our young people that we are blessed to have here at Stonehouse Baptist Church from reading to magic, singing, drawing, Lego, acting and maths. And a sign that God grants us gifts, each individual gifts, but each valuable, each important, each unique and each individual. I'd like to take a few moments just to pray for our young people here, but also to pray for the young people across the country. So let's let's do that. Let's pray now. Lord, we thank you for the young people of Stonehouse Baptist Church. We thank you for their personalities, for their gifts, for the joy and wonder that they bring to us. We thank you for the passion that they have for Jesus, for the love that they have for you, for the joy that they bring to this church. And we ask, Lord, that you are with them, that you are with those who are returning to school at this time, that you will keep them safe, that you will keep them healthy and protected, that you are with those who are remaining at home, that they will feel your presence that they will not be lonely or, or feel excluded in any way. And this is our prayer for all of the young people across the nation, Lord. That whatever their circumstances, whatever the situation they are in, that they will know you. That you will bring people into their lives who can share the good news of Jesus Christ. That you will guide and comfort, protect and nourish them. We know how much Jesus loved children, Lord, how he welcomed them, how he declared to us that in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, we had to have that same faith, the faith of a child. And so we thank you for all of our young people as they show us how to worship you, as they show us how to have true, authentic and genuine faith in you. For your sake. And we lift them to you, Lord. Be with them, protect them and guide them in all that they do. Amen. Our reading this morning is a continuation of the book of Ephesians and we reach chapter 4 verses 7 to 16. And I'm really grateful that this morning Charlie has recorded and brought our reading to us. So this is Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 7 to 16. Ephesians 4, 7 to 16. But to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, 
When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. One of these things is not like the others. One of these things doesn't belong. Can you tell which thing is not like the other by the time I finish this song? Yes, it's time to play one of those things is not like the other. Now, if you've not played this game before or if you haven't watched Sesame Street, firstly, where have you been? Secondly, it's really straightforward. I'm going to show you a picture and in that picture, one of the things will not be like the other things. S pretty straightforward, I think you'll agree. And all you have to do is identify which of the things is not like the other thing. So if we were together in the same space, in the same building, if we were meeting as normal at the school, I would be asking you to put your hands up or call these things out, that kind of stuff. Of course, uh, we're online, so we can't quite do that. But I am going to encourage you to call out at home. Talking back to the TV has been fashionable for many years, and I don't see why we should stop now. At the end of the game, though, what would be great is if you could pop in the comments just how many of those you got right. Uh, and we'll see there's no prize for the winner. It's just a bit of fun. So let's start with something fairly simple. One of these things is not like the other. OK, so I hope you've all got that one. So moving on to slide number two. One of these things is not like the other. And possibly slightly harder now. One of these things is not like the other. You'll never guess what. One of these things, it's not like the other. And finally, something much harder. One of these things is not like the other. OK, so I have to confess, I kind of cheated in that last one. They are, in fact, all exactly the same as the other. But the other four, I'm sure you were all able to guess. Uh, and also, I noticed a preponderance of animals, which may tell you a little bit about the kinds of pictures that people uh, send me in emails on the Internet. So in those pictures, some of the things were really obviously different to the others, but some were not. Now, when I first became a Christian, I was convinced, I was absolutely certain that in order to really be a Christian, I had to be more like that last image we saw. I had to look, dress, behave, speak, act, 
think, pray, be just like every other Christian. And I came to believe that that was the only way I was ever going to be mature in Christ. If I didn't look the right way, if I didn't talk the right way, if I didn't pray the right way, I was never going to be a mature Christian. And so I cut my hair. I took out my ear piercings, I stopped wearing ripped jeans and hoodies, and I tried to fit into this mould of Christianity that I perceived all around me. And then one day, I was reading the verses that we have today. And I was suddenly struck by something really astonishing. And it seems so simple when we read about it. But at the time, it was earth-shaking for me. It completely changed the way I considered my faith. You see, I realised that God called me. He called me for who I was. Not some homogenised version of me, but me, with all the idiosyncrasies and peculiarities that I have. Now, God, I also know, made me. And I also know that God didn't make mistakes. So surely when God revealed himself to me, when God called me, when he called me into his church through his son, he called me as me. Now, I wonder how many of you have felt the same way as I did. I wonder how many of you still do. The church can be a wonderful, multifaceted diamond with each aspect reflecting the glory of God through his infinite diversity as he has created and called us. And yet so often... The church is not that. So often it's a place where we feel we have to conform, where we have to fit in or we're not quite doing this faith thing right. We're not reaching the maturity in Christ because we don't look like the others. Now, as we look at verses 7 to 16 of Ephesians chapter 4 this morning, we may find that God is telling us something very different is going on. So if you have a Bible, if you have uh, the text on a phone or an app or the internet or however else you are accessing it this morning, please do turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 to 16. These verses are an interesting uh, set of verses, and they seem to stand in complete contrast to what Paul has written before. Paul has placed a huge emphasis on the importance of unity in verses 1 to 6 of this chapter. And you'd be forgiven for thinking that up to that point, what he's presenting us is an image of church where each and every person is more or less exactly like everybody else. And yet the reality of the church of Christ is not one of bland and colourless uniformity where each Christian is a carbon copy clone but one of rich diversity, of exciting difference. And this, Paul suggests, is not only the reality of the church as it finds itself, but the plan and the purpose of the church in the first place. We see revealed here that God in his infinite wisdom and grace has made it so that we cannot simply become nondescript replicas of one another, but that in our diversity, in our individuality, we find ourselves bound together by our shared faith and given to one another for growth and maturity. As Paul writes to the Ephesians, he reminds them and us of our unique place in God's creation, in, in the church of Christ, that the call each of us has is to use our gifts given by God for the building up and sustenance of one another in faith and in love. So as we come to contemplate God's word this morning, let's pray. Lord, as we spend time thinking of your word this morning, we pray that our hearts and minds may be opened by your Holy Spirit and that we may know and love you more deeply and that in this act of knowing and loving, we may be shaped more and more into the likeness of your son, Jesus Christ, who revealed you to us and in whose name we offer this and all of our prayers this morning. Amen. So Paul's shift in emphasis here signals his desire for the Ephesians to recognise and celebrate their uniqueness as being a gift of God, as being a gift from God for the growing of the corporate church. 
Far from picturing the believers and presenting them as cookie cutter beings formed in some sort of cosmic mould that is used over and over and over again, Paul wants his readers, and that's us, to grasp the astonishing truth that it is actually our differences which enable us to grow and mature in faith. It's our differences that allow us to become more Christ-like in our living. John Calvin once wrote that no member of the body of Christ is endowed with such perfection as to be able without the assistance of others to supply his own necessities. That's an astonishing thing to think about. We cannot reach the fullness of Christ. We cannot become mature believers in Christ. We cannot achieve that walk, that Christ-like journey, without the help and gifts of the others whom God places around us. Let me illustrate this, perhaps. For most of my life, I've been a musician. Now, I started off at school with the obligatory recorder lessons and then noodling on the family piano at home before I eventually took up the trumpet and my first formal tuition was on the trumpet. Apparently, though, that wasn't quite loud enough or attention grabbing enough for me. So in a bid to become even more the focus of attention, I eventually found myself to the wonders of percussion. And there it was that I stayed throughout my school time and into a professional career. Now, the fact is, I was never, ever going to be a solo artist, and I never really wanted to either, because my great passion was always for playing with other musicians, for participating in a group activity. There was nothing quite as wonderful, quite as magical to me as being part of a group who were gathered together with the one goal in mind, to offer the very best of ourselves in performance whether in a concert pit, uh, uh, an orchestra pit, or, or in, uh, in the studio. And the truth is, I could never have done any of those things by myself. Symphonies would have lacked something if the orchestra was literally just me stood at the back crashing some cymbals together from time to time. Rock music would have been far less exciting if it was just me sitting there bashing the drums. And the occasional ting on a triangle does not, for an exciting concert experience, make. I could only contribute and play my part because of the gifts of others. And I could only grow in maturity and depth of musicianship when I was surrounded by others with their own gifts, their own experiences and their own callings. The church is very much like an orchestra. Each of us plays our part. Each of us has a contribution to make to the symphony that God is writing across creation. And each of us needs those around us, those who are contributing along with us, the harmonies, melodies and rhythms that God has given. Paul reminds us in verse 7, each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. When Paul uses the word grace here, He's referring to that sense, that privilege of a special calling to serve God. Each one of us who has heard God calling us into faith, each one of us who has come to faith through Christ and be reborn into this new redeemed life that God has granted us through his son is in receipt of this grace. We are called into the service of God. And the reality for those of us who are called children of God is that we are each and every individual one of us granted spiritual gifts and tasks. And that we are given these by Christ himself for the building of the church and for growth to maturity of faith. Not only of our own faith, but that of the people whom God has called to be around us. The people whom we are called to love and to serve. Now, it's important, I think, that we note that these are gifts from God to us. We don't earn them. We don't choose them either. We are given them by Christ. And if we haven't earned them, if we haven't chosen them, if they've been given to us by Christ, there can be no boasting in them. None of us has done anything to deserve the gifts we've been given. And we don't get the gifts based on our merit. And likewise, the gifts that are given don't have a hierarchy. There are no better or more significant or more important gifts that God bestows. Each and every gift is required for the body to build in strength and fullness. Each and every gift matters and each and every person's gift is equally as important as the next. Each voice 
in an orchestra contributes to the fullness of the sound. Each Christian in the church contributes to the fullness of the body. Now, sometimes, sometimes we do fall into a way of thinking that says it's actually only a select few who receive the gifts of God. That's simply not the case. That is just not the case. Sometimes we may look at our preachers, we may look at our worship leaders, we may look at those who pray great, deep, powerful prayers, those who have the gifts of healing or peacemaking, those who work with children, those who have very visible gifts, outwardly manifesting gifts, and think that those, oh, they must be the important gifts. Those must be the gifts that matter. And so the people who've got those gifts are in some kind of spiritually superior class. Well, this is just not so. God apportions out his gifts in his wisdom to all his people and each and every one, each and every gift, whether visible and at the front or very hidden and secret, each and every gift is vital for the building up of the church and the growing to full maturity in Christ. Those who preach should preach, Paul will write at some point. But he may also well have said those who make coffee should make coffee and do so to the glory of Christ. Those who lead worship should lead worship to the glory of God. Those who put the chairs out should put the chairs out to the glory of God and so on and so forth. Each and every task equally as important and equally as deserving of our full commitment. Paul picks this theme up throughout his writings Clearly, the early church struggled as much with this as we do. In Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 4, he writes these words. There are varieties of gift, but the same spirit. Now, the truth is that our gifts will inform our ministries. The way in which God gifts us will determine how we can best dis uh, serve him and how we can best contribute to the building of his church and kingdom here on earth. When I was playing in an orchestra, for example, when I was making a living doing music, one of the gifts I had was that of sight reading. So uh, I could be given a piece of music and look through it once or twice and then play it pretty much as it was supposed to be played. Now, that meant that I would get certain types of jobs and they would fall into my lap quite naturally. Last minute calls, sudden jobs that needed doing. That gift defined my ministry. What I was less good at, for example, was being a solo performer. And I used to get such terrible stage fright. I couldn't stand up. So I was never going to be a concerto soloist. I was never going to be a solo artist because that terrified me. The very thought of it. The gift I had informed the job I did. The gifts we have informed the ministry that we have. Now, perhaps you're sat there and you're thinking, yeah, the word ministry, though, that just means of ministers, doesn't it? That means the people who lead our churches, the ordained and lay leaders who we call the minister. And, and perhaps that is our understanding of ministry. But what Paul is pointing us towards is the truth that each and every person has a ministry. Each and every one of us is called to minister in one capacity or another. And in fact, the word ministry itself is nothing more than a term for the activity that we are called to undertake for the kingdom of God. It's how we serve God. So Paul lays out five models of ministry in these verses, some more or less familiar to us. He talks of the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers. And he says that Christ himself gave them to equip his people for works of service so that the body may be built up. Now, each of these roles has a distinctive character and calling, but none is more or less important than the other. Each of these is given to the people so that the body may be built up. Each and every ministry. And if your gift informs your ministry, then your gift is given for the building up of the body. Paul writes that the gifts were given to equip the people for works of service so that the body may be built up. No one ministry is more important. No one ministry is more valuable. No one ministry is more worthwhile than any of the others. God calls and equips his people in our huge diversity and our huge variety to build up the unity of the body of Christ. That is the church, 
here on earth. This is our calling in life. This is what we're here for. We are invited to participate in the building of the kingdom of God through his church, the bride of Christ, which God gave to us and for us. That he calls each and every one of us into service in this church is an amazing testament to the grace and goodness of our amazing and wonderful father. That he gives us gifts and ministries to serve his purposes is a, a sign of his wisdom and love for his children. So how are we doing with that this morning? How are we using our gifts for the service of God's church? How are we building up the body of Christ through our acts of service? through humble giving and grace-filled willingness to recognise our part in the body. Friends, what ministry might God be calling you today? What gifts has he given you to equip you to do that ministry? And how are you being formed into the whole measure of Christ? Because ultimately that's what it's about. It's all about Jesus. It's all about following and serving him. And by God's grace, and in his mercy, becoming more Christ-like in our own lives. The church is here for one purpose only. To become more like Christ. To see his kingdom built here on earth. It's the ultimate fulfilment of the original creation purpose. It's the heart of our calling to be Christian. To become more like Christ. We cannot do this alone. We cannot achieve this maturity, this fullness, this Christ-likeness in our lives without those whom God places around us. And we have to recognise that the gifts and ministries of our fellow believers are given as much for our benefit as they are for the benefit of them, of the church and the world at large. Friends, God is writing the symphony of his kingdom throughout all of creation and he calls us to add our distinctive and unique voice to the orchestra. Some of us will be called to carry the tune, others a harmony, others still the bass line or a rhythm. But each part is integral to the whole. Each part we play is vital to the song that is being written and performed through us as any other. For God has blessed us each with gifts, different gifts that are given to different people, calling into different ministries, each as valuable and vital as the next. So will we play our part? with devotion and dedication as we take our place in God's church, as we sit in his orchestra? Will we place ourselves into the service of others, building up the body as we serve the Lord and equip his people for the works of ministry? Nothing less than the building of God's kingdom here on earth. As we contemplate the awesomeness of this calling on our lives, let's recommit ourselves this morning to Christ, our head, and to one another, the body of the church to which we are called. And let's do that by sharing some words together now. And I'm going to invite you to share the words that come up in bold on your screen. God, today we believe that you dwell in all who confess Jesus as the Son of God. God, Today we will open our ears to hear each one who confesses Jesus as the Son of God. God, we believe that you invite us to accept each other as sisters and brothers. God, today we accept and embrace all who call themselves by your name. God, we believe that you call us to love each other as we do ourselves. God, with all our hearts, we will strive to love our brothers and sisters from every denomination and group. God, we believe you ask us to use our gifts to serve each other in unity and understanding. God, may we, in a spirit of love and care, use our gifts to build each other up. God, we believe that in unity together, we will come to a full knowledge of Christ. God, may we grow together into the knowledge of the one in whom all things fit together. Amen.
I want to thank you so much for joining us this morning here at Stonehouse Baptist Church online. It has been a real pleasure and a real privilege to worship with you this morning, wherever you are gathered, wherever you are from, however you have come to this time of worship. And our prayer is that you have been blessed and encouraged, that you have been nourished, that you have been equipped, that you have heard the voice of God, felt the presence of the Spirit and encountered Jesus Christ in your life today. Thank you for being with us. We'll be here again next week, and we'll be here every week throughout lockdown, bringing you the good news of Jesus Christ, sharing in worship and praise, praying with one another, singing with one another. And we'd love to be in touch with you during this time. We'd love to hear from you. And you can reach out to us in so many different ways. There's really no excuse not to be in touch with us. None whatsoever. So we're on the web at www.stonehousebaptist.org.uk. You can email us on contact at stonehousebaptist.org.uk. 
You can find us on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash Stonehouse Baptist. And if you're watching this morning on Facebook or YouTube and you are new to us or you are not a regular or you want us to reach out to you, why not drop us a comment below or reach out to us in a message or through one of those ways. We would love to be in touch, to pray with you, to worship with you and to walk with you during these strange days in which we find ourselves. Friends, it has been a pleasure to be with you this morning and it falls to me only to close with a blessing. And I do bless you. Bless you in the name of God, the Father who created and who sustains all. I bless you in the name of Jesus who revealed God to us and who died for us. And I bless you in the name of the Holy Spirit, God who walks with us to this day. May you feel his presence with you and surround you. May you be kept, may you be protected, may you know peace and joy and nourishment throughout the days ahead. And God willing, I'll see you here again next week at Stonehouse Baptist Church Online, 11am on Sunday the 21st of June. God bless you and keep you. See you soon.